sounds of thanksgiving. Let us pray. 
Eternal God, thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you for blessing us with your presence. Open our hearts and our minds now to hear and to see what you need for us to hear and see. In Christ we pray. Amen. Paul's first letter to the newly established church in Thessalonica is primarily a letter of thanksgiving. He expressed much thanksgiving to God because Timothy had visited the young church and had returned with a message for Paul about their faith and their loyalty. Paul had been especially concerned about this young church because shortly after he started it, he had been run out of town by some Jews who were pretty upset that he had been successful in converting both Jews and Gentiles to the belief that Jesus really is the Messiah. Paul feared might hap what might happen to this little church without his leadership and given the persecution of the synagogue. So out of what must have been much elation, in spite of his own persecution that he was experiencing, Paul wrote a letter to this church to tell them that he gave thanks to God always for you all, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before God and our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of the letter, he exhorted the children of God at the church in Thessalonica to also be thankful. Here is what he wrote toward the end of his letter, chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. All I need to do is find verse 16. <laughs> Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. This short passage is one that is often misunderstood. So we need to take a really careful look at it. Verses 16 and 17 say, Rejoice always and pray continually. The tone here is one of exhorting people, of giving them maxims to live by. But when Paul says rejoice always, he is not giving them another law that they are to follow. Instead, he is describing a way of being in this world. Rejoicing always is something we can't force. We cannot force ourselves to rejoice. It must come from our inner being. Now, Paul is not intending that we should work at rejoicing. Instead, he points us toward the need always to remember all the blessings that God gives us. Those blessings are not bound by what happens in our day-to-day -day lives. The blessing God gives transcend all that, and they evoke joy deep within us. Lately, we have frequently seen interviews on the nightly news of people who have lost everything because their homes were destroyed 
either by fire or explosions. We've seen that happening in our own state and in California. Victims often comment, but we have each other, and that's really all that is important. While that may sound trite to us as the cameraman scans all the ash and the rubble of what once was, to those who have survived, there is a reality that blessings such as life, love, and loved ones are more precious than all of the things that are now reduced to ash. The blessing that it is always possible to rebuild life with the help of God, friends, and loved ones is more, much more precious than material possessions. Praying continually is to be part of who we are. We pray because we are God's children and prayer is the way that we communicate with the Lord that we love. God knows we talk constantly. That's just a natural act of being human. We do not need to tell ourselves to talk, and we do not need to set up a specific time of the day or night to talk to people. <laughs> Just put a smartphone in any of our hands. We do it naturally. Likewise, Paul exhorts us to pray to be in communication with God. In a very real sense, Paul calls us to look a bit at our own human nature and what comes natural to us. He calls us to look at maybe some things that come by nature that we need to let go, and maybe some things that should come by nature and don't quite, that we need to ask God to help us with. If frequent conversation with God is not something we do by nature, then we need to ask God to help us cultivate and to work in us to pray more and become more communicative with God. And now we come to the verse that says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. At first glance, people often interpret this verse to mean that we are to be thankful for everything that happens to us, the good things and the bad things. They interpret Paul's letter to mean that it is God's will in Christ Jesus for them to suffer in whatever ways they are suffering. Such an idea is certainly enough to make us question God's love, but it's also bad theology. One way of correcting this misunderstanding is to focus on the preposition in. The Apostle Paul says, be thankful in all circumstances, not for all circumstances. We do not need to be thankful for illness poverty, and wars. God is not asking us to be thankful for suffering and pain. Rather, 
We are not to let the hard circumstances in life stop our spirits from being aware of the blessings God continues to give us. Blessings that transcend all of the suffering and torment. So consider what this means in verse 18, which says, For this is God's will for you. One way to interpret the meaning of that is to think that Paul meant, Be thankful for all of the circumstances. But another ter interpretation is that this refers to pray continually, give thanks continually, rejoice always. In other words, God's will is for us to be thankful and prayerful no matter what is happening in our day-to-day -day lives. Our ability and willingness to pray and give thanks should not be contingent on whether we are experiencing happy times or sad and stressful times. We have much to be thankful for even when we go through bad times. God continues to bless us and we need to notice those blessings and be thankful for them. So how do we do that? Our human tendency is to get stuck in whatever the problem in our life happens to be. How often does the crisis du jour take up most of your day and most of your thoughts? And yet that's not the only thing that's going on in your day. It follows that our prayer life becomes a matter that revolves around the prayer, God, make this stop. God, get me through this. God, show me how to endure. And on and on it goes. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians reminds us that there is more to life than the problems that come with life. Illness strikes. God blesses us with medicines and people who are trained in knowing how to treat us. Death strikes. And we feel lost and alone as we grieve. And God brings to us family and friends to support us in our grief. We know we're not alone. We fall on hard financial times and through the caring acts of others we find shelter and food to eat. Are we to be thankful for illness, death, and hard financial times? Certainly not. But we are not to allow those situations to swallow us whole and keep us from recognizing all the blessings and giving thanks for all the blessings that God continues to give. The thankfulness that Paul had in mind, though, goes far beyond praying thank you, like we learned to say when we were children. In the original Greek manuscript, the word translated as give thanks is Eucharistu. Eucharistu. Does it sound maybe like something you've ever heard before? The root word is Eucharist, the word often used for the Lord's Supper. Thought of in this way, 
giving thanks is done in and through Christ. Our spirits are engaged in giving thanks through Christ to whom we are united by the Holy Spirit in the act of giving thanks. In other words, we are no longer standing before God with distance between us and the one before whom we stand. We are no longer standing like we would in front of a friend or a relative and saying thank you for a favor or a gift. Giving thanks is a deeper matter of communion with God. It is Eucharistic thankfulness. In that communion, our spirits touch the Spirit of God that reaches out and embraces us. That's what being a child of God is all about. Paul knew that, and he wanted the people in Thessalonica to experience that kind of joyful thanksgiving, that Eucharistic thanksgiving. The kind of thanksgiving in which we are united to Christ. We celebrate Thanksgiving Day not so much because we remember the feast enjoyed by the early Massachusetts settlers and their Wampanoag neighbors, but because we, like them, recognize that in spite of perilous times, God blesses our lives. Out of love for God, our spirits want to touch the giver of all that we have and feel the embrace of joyful thanks that come not just from polished manners, but from deep within our spirits. For ours is a Eucharistic thanks, an expression of thanks that touches and is embraced by the God who loves us so much that he came to live with us on earth so that we might one day live with him in heaven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us stand and say together what we believe using a short portion of the Heidelberg Catechism. How does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? We can be patient when things go against us, thankful when things go well, and for the future we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that nothing in creation will separate us from his love for all creatures are so completely in God's hand that without his will they can neither move nor be moved. <laughs>